Here we go. Good afternoon, everybody. Scott Stevens here with a look at another perspective here on the Metadime Network. And we are uh, endeavoring to bring you a different point of view on some other issues. And now that we have uh, an incredible raft or potential of social media around the world, there are points of view from the left to the right, a little bit down the middle, from high and low. They're, they're really just kind of all over the place. And that's not a bad thing. It lets us look at a menu of things that lets us digest a whole lot of information. And that is a good thing. You know, coming from the scientific community, that's what you want to have a look at. That is what's most important, is having a menu of points of view. And eventually, through your experience, you begin to cluster around a concept. You begin to cluster around a theory that you either find workable or not workable for a long period of time. And then you're back out looking at for uh, looking at another uh, point of view that uh, ultimately works for you. So that's uh, kind of where uh, where I am with this. And uh, good to see uh, Vicky and Karen come aboard uh, on this little bit of an afternoon. And you know, if you're working, I get it. We have hashtag replay for that particular option. Uh, Robin and Cydia uh, coming on as, as well this afternoon. You know, we live in tumultuous times, straight up. It's kind of scary when you see the news, uh, you know, what, what's happening, how close these demonstrations have been. It was different when it was one thing and it started in the in Minneapolis. But as it has begun to spread by design, by accident, by just sheer release of anger and frustration with the system. And in some ways, well, in many ways, race had to be that initiator that had to be the starter. That had to be the one valve that was let go first because this race issue has been global for so long and suppressed aggressively for so long. So in some ways, it doesn't surprise me and it shouldn't surprise us that this was the one. And then you know, what becomes the trigger? And it is kind of curious that it was Minneapolis, but then in sympathy, in solidarity, in union, the 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 actions spread and and that's not a bad thing because it isn't until we see a change in how we think and how we communicate with each other that we can ultimately come to uh, a change and a resolution and I don't know if that's going to happen in my lifetime it doesn't seem like it's going to and certainly not with the polit political leadership we have on either side of the aisle I really don't care none of them none of them have been able to address this in one way or another I'm sure that leadership does exist but it doesn't presently exist in uh, a, a position of office. I'm going to start over here. We're going to do a, a little bit of share, go through some slides here of um, things that are happening. And this is just moi for now. And uh, we'll start with some censorship that we kind of left off yesterday or last week when we talked about this. We talked about it, the different points of view that the media shows us. And we either buy into it, and that's a choice, or we don't buy into it because it doesn't fit the narrative that we either have concocted for ourselves or adopted from someone else. 
It did go all the way to Europe, Vicky. We'll have a look at that. But let's start with this, this premise. So what are or is the concept or concepts we hold of ourselves as Americans? And this can be stretched out as, as Europeans, as, as Latinos, as, uh, as Asians, as Hong Kongers, as Chinese, as Japanese. It does not have to be Americans. It's just on the broader scale because Black Lives Matter, all lives matter as well. And this is something that we have to ask individually. But for the point of this, We'll start, what are the concepts we hold of ourselves as Americans? We are, as a whole, in great discomfort. That is apparent by looking at what's going on in the world, because we are channeling, we are carrying, we are expressing, we are talking about a current or an energy or a concept that is far less than our true potential. And we only have to go back to the founding of this nation or even the resolution of, of the Civil War to begin to get a grasp of what our potential truly can be. And this is a blessing because now we can come to understand that we are greater than the very barriers that we face. And for me, this is a big one. And we'll, we'll, there's another Buddhist saying that applies to this, this very thing, because if we can recognize that we are not all we want to be, that we are not all we can be or strive to be or want to leave to our children, then we can accept the simple fact that we have problems. So if people truly understood the extent to which their mental narrative dominates their experience in life, and this is from Caitlin Johnstone. She has she's she's British and she's got a she's a prolific author and always with a little bit of a contrarian point of view. And it's fun to read, even if you don't agree with it, because she makes you think, makes you consider concepts that wouldn't have come to you largely otherwise. And, and I appreciate that about our work. And maybe one day we'll have her on the show here. If people truly understand the extent to which mental narrative dominates their experience of life, propaganda advertising and all other forms of psychological manipulation would be regarded by our society similarly to physical assault or property theft. So what she's doing is letting you, reminding you of the situation that your psychological identity, that your thoughts, how you feel about things are your own. And if you surrender that to an outside point of view, it's an assault or it is, an, a, it is a theft. And that to me is a huge, huge wake up call to realize that you have to maintain your identity. You have to not necessarily hold on to these concepts of yourself so strongly that they can't be changed. Because if you can't say at some point in your life, I was wrong about that. I see that now. I recognize that now. I was wrong. And if you can't go about that road, if you can't make that simple admission that potentially that you were, you know, in the in in the point of error about that, then you'll never be shown. You'll never come to know what is right. And yes, Vicky, in a way, you are you are absolutely giving away a power. You're giving away your only power, that which you have under yourself. So, at what point? How do we think about or what is our concept of ourselves when we see images like this? When we see the peaceful protests become violent protests, which then become resisting, which has happened you know, for a couple of years now, to simply outright theft and looting. Where is that line? Where is that boundary, which is legal protesting to outright destruction of private property? It becomes this kind of scary barrier that we willingly jump across and some aggressively go there. They'll, they'll jump in the car. I'm like, mm, we're going to go rioting. Do you want to join me? And that, that doesn't bring the memory of the loss of the people protest. That, that loss for George is then gone because there is another agenda at play. So we have the kind of wanton destruction, and then we have this, where protesters surround a Lexington, Kentucky, I believe it was, Metro police officer in front of Barrios on Thursday, May 28th. This pro these, the protest organizers surrounded the officer and joined arms to make sure that the crowd did not touch him. So there is still, despite what the news media would like to have out there, good in us. And I believe we inherently default to truth. We have, at our core, a beautiful part of us 
that the political agenda, that the mental narrative, it is constantly through media, through, 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 through music, through movies, through news, is there to take from us, to hide from us. And so these men are protecting that officer that at this time, there he is back there, was separated from, from his team and was obviously going to be grossly outnumbered and in danger. And if you go looking for wanton destruction and, and acts of violence against officers, acts of violence against uh, others, then you'll find them. They're there because you're going to see, look for, and find those kind of experiences. But if you want to see the beauty of humanity, that is there as well. All right, a little little backup. This is gonna we're gonna couple of, cover a couple of different topics here uh, in time, um, because part of what's been happening is the media has been, and this was my background. What was the media? And you, we had to be, or at least pretend to be neutral on subjects. If you wanted to talk about something that was out of bounds, you had to really do it in a circuitous, a roundabout, colored kind of quiet way. And that just didn't, you know, that was not allowed. Then it's amazing since the last time I was officially on the air at a branded uh, network station, which has been 15 years now, 15 years of September, it's changed. It is out and out blatant partisanism. Uh, Mika Brezhnikov, uh, Brzezinski, excuse me, uh, quote, I'll be reaching out to the head of Twitter about the policies being violated every day by President Trump. I hope my call is taken. Please retweet if you agree. And by the time I took this screenshot, she had already had nearly a quarter million likes and 160,000 people were talking about this. So what, what she's doing is creating a mob. A mob, a quote unquote social justice mob that she believed in her view that that point was was valid. She wanted to be able to take it out into the open. And this is where what seems to be like a, a, a worthy cause for social justice can then be used for control of the narrative and control of the freedom of expression of ideas. This is their big push for global control of all aspects of what this, this author called the wire. These are the conducts of communication that are vital to society. The wire is simply a metaphor for the transmission of information. The wire takes many forms. And if you're, if you're, if you aren't sure whether something is the wire, just ask if you have control of it or not. For you history bruffs, go back to the great depression, the great depression. In the 1930s, what federal agency to control the wire was founded at another point where there was great turmoil in this country? And that was the FCC, the Federal Communications Corporation. It was at that point where the wire, we had so many free radio stations and they were put up a tower, get your transmitter and talk to the public. We had free exchange of information. And they were very potent in controlling, well, not even controlling, but suggesting to the public that there was another way of doing business. That FDR and the march to war, the FDR and the confiscation of gold, how to deploy resources to get the population of the country back to work. But those didn't work with the government narrative. And so we had to establish the FCC, which then if you didn't have a license, couldn't afford a license, weren't approved a license, there went your AM your AM broadcast station, which with not too many watts could reach hundreds and hundreds of miles as we can still hear at night with AM radio and correspondingly then millions of listeners. Before the FCC, the analogy would be the internet, 1990s and then last decade. And so Donald Trump, uh, well, that didn't take long as, as we saw in the previous tweet. Uh, what did what did Twitter do? Twitter's now showing everything we've been saying about them and other compatriots is correct. Big action to follow. All right. So what is what was Twitter trying to do? And this from their 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 rules platform that I just screenshotted today. We have a set of rules for the hundreds of millions of people who use Twitter and the hundreds of millions of tweets sent out every day to make Twitter a safer platform. The Twitter rules quote incorporate the latest trends of online behavior. So they're they're establishing rules out in the open around trends around trends, not moralism or not what's right or what's wrong, but online trends. Considering the different cultural and societal contexts, this helps set expectations around what's allowed for the platform. And that truly is as generic as the rules get. 
So what is the law? And this is Twitter's own law. And that was one of the things the president tried to do the other uh, last week, I believe it was just last week, was remove the restrictions on liability against these social media platforms. So they are then liable for slander, liability, uh, per liable, or just being untruthful. So the law is not a moral compass. The people who hit Frank were breaking the law and the people who killed her were following it. It just kind of gives us an idea of how loosey-goosey this is. All right, this is completely off the topic, but again, not at all. Food for thought. The last time Saturn was in Aquarius, and I know we've got some some astrologer buffs out there, and there's a lot of them in the world. That is a big business getting your 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 cards and your charts and your numbers read. But there's some truth in, in a lot of in all of these psychic sciences because they do have an element of that, of that. But anyway, what happens when these other energies are impacting Earth? The last time Saturn was in Aquarius was during the Rodney King riots in '92, if you recall that. The last time Pluto was in, Capri in uh, Capricorn was during the American Revolution. So that's a much larger cycle. And then Neptune was in Pisces. When Rome fell, we have all three right now. So as we, we saw these, these riots break out, the better part of, uh, actually just a bit more than a week ago now, Minnesota Governor Tom Waltz summed up the current chaos erupting nationwide perfectly. This is absolute no longer about George Floyd or addressing inequities anymore. This is an organized attack designed to destabilize civil society. I'll say it again. This is absolutely no longer about George Floyd or addressing inequities anymore. This is an organized attack designed to destabilize society. And this I screenshotted probably five days ago over the weekend, and these were just some of the larger cities that were impacted. And now we know we're out to 140 cities and the, the protests, the gatherings, the demonstrations have spread globally, certainly far more dense in the States, but nevertheless, they are showing up. And if I can get over to Twitter, we'll look at some of those. So the question is, who's behind it? What's behind it? Why the organization? And there's so much in this that I have, I have honestly left out because it, it, it's, it's difficult to get to. So what we have seen over the last several years, and there was even a video I saw yesterday of, of, of a former first lady, uh, Hillary Clinton, introducing George Soros to a group of, of, of donors. And he was saying that we, it's time for us to move into and begin to affect the conversation that we're having in the United States. And this video is probably 30 years old, just prior to or during the first Clinton election. So this man has had an interest in the United States, even being an Eastern European by birth, but his United States is, he, there's a lot of money to be made here. There's a lot of potential. There's a lot of change that could be affected by affecting the United States. So by quote, September of 14, I'm going to bring down the United States by funding black hate groups. We'll put them in a mental trap and make them blame white people. The black community is the easiest to manipulate. Emotions are a very powerful tool. And once you can corrupt those emotions and bring in the lower ones of fear, of hate, of anxiety, of poverty, then you can begin to shape a narrative through the media if you hit them with that over and over and over and over again. So Friends of Democracy, you can Google it up. And this, these papers are five years old now. And I that wasn't Rod Nicking, that was uh, LA in 92. Um, but they had another period of social unrest in the Baltimore area. And this group, which is funded directly by Jonathan Soros's, uh, George Soros's grandson. This is now his baby as, as George is handing this down to the next generation to ensure that his, his legacy, that his agenda crosses the generation. So what we have here, and, and you'll be able to pause the video and look at some of these, is how organized these organizations to sow chaos, to sow discord, to sow damage, to sow pain inside of the communities that are asking for redress for the inequities, for the the hate, for the the biases that have been against them for so long. And so it's like you're you're using this Black Lives Matter movement against itself. They're in the mental trap. And they're right for wanting to protest, but then you have these other agitators that are paid for <clears throat> by con contract 
to go ahead. So the primary concern is agitation of local civilian population, escalation of civilian unrest in the Baltimore, Washington area, and provocation of the hostile, hostile law enforcement and Baltimore, Washington officials. Secondary goal, escalation of law enforcement deployment in the Baltimore, Washington area, galvanization of friendly and usefully allied organizations, the enemy of my friend. So, so, so it goes. Then the creation of an environment where organic conflict can go. So if we have a population that is feeling or is simply um, repressed for generations, this organic conflict is ready to sprout. All it needs is the water. All it needs is the fuel. All it needs is the excuse to then show up. So the tertiary designs where the recruitment and up to the discretion of the agitators, the seeding of other organic actions and other locations throughout the United States, hoping that what they foster, what they, they nurture in Baltimore in the terms of violence and uprising, then can go out into communities that are already to, to sprout into violence. Then their ideal solution, their ideal desired end is civil unrest that leads to the deployment of martial law po like policies for Baltimore, Washington, creating a feedback loop. loop. And with that, additional action opportunities will arise. So that lets you know that this man with his 30 plus off, off billion dollars has uh, you know, a way to get about it. And you do that by controlling the narrative. And if you can turn these against the, the, the president either way, and you can use what is Orwell that we talked about last week is this perpetual double speak. That we say one thing when we really, really mean another, and then tomorrow we'll turn those words right around, use it against the target, whatever that target is, whether it's the population that's in uprising, whether it's the agitators, whether it's the victims. The victims are always turned into the perpetrators. That's just kind of how, how it works. So on the media, this was, uh, found this earlier this week. How many of you back in 2012 saw the movie World War Z? I'm always, for some unknown reason, maybe it was just the time of, of, of society that we're born into, fascinated by these disaster movies, fascinated by not so much zombie movies, but war movies where the end of civilization is laid out for you. It's a pandemic. It's an infection. It's 2012. You know, there, there is some big civilization changing event and they'll pack the theaters for weeks to go see that disaster movie. It's like we, we come into these lives pre-programmed to see this kind of, kind of disaster. Yeah, Robert, World War Z, it's, uh, it's an infection. It's truly like a, war, a world war full of zombies. And, and this end scene or one of the end scenes in where they go to Jerusalem, where they think it's a safe place because they've built this wall around, uh, uh, around Israel to keep the Palestinians and to keep the, uh, the, you know, the, the other non-Jews out, then, um, then that's kind of where the final scene goes. And Brad Pitt has a, a heroic scene there. So what happened was MSNBC literally used video from the movie and then showed it as breaking news across Los Angeles. Well, you know, it's not like we're dumb. And so somebody went, found the trailer on World War, uh, uh, on World War Z on YouTube. There it is. There's the time in, you know, right this far into the movie. And there's the exact same shot. So there is this aggressive move to keep us, you know, outside of where we need to be looking. So if we can make it look like the, the, the city's on fire, then maybe it, ultimately it'll become on fire. You know, we'll, we'll help that along because that fits the agenda of bringing down whatever story they want to have unfold. Martin Luther King, returning violence for violence multiplies violence, adding a deeper darkness to the night already devoid of stars. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. And that's why I showed at the top of the show some of the examples of love and looking out for one another because those acts of love are what we like to term first cause. They're not a reactionary one. They come from inside. They come from that part of you, which is and always will be most powerful. That source of love, that heart, that soul part of you. And it's inside all of us. And it recognizes it. It sympathizes with it. It wants to resonate with it just by default because of who and how we're made. And so that is going to be the easiest place and yet the most difficult place for us to go and to find during all of this. Now, during these events, it was kind of um, kind of crazy. 
because last weekend was was full of chaos, but yet we had SpaceX and NASA finally returning man to space. And it was exciting to watch this happen Saturday afternoon as uh, as two astronauts went aloft, the successful launch, even after SpaceX had that epic explosion at Cape Canaveral the day before as they were doing some pressure testing with fuel uh, of a different kind of craft. But then this, this guy, we were trying to get Americans back into space. The previous administration had literally shut down the space program. So we were going to be wholly dependent on on the, the Russians to get us to space or probably eventually the Chinese. I think that was probably the longer term goal is that we would have been dependent on the Chinese to get anything we wanted into space outside of, of the satellite and, and certainly military cargo that would have been held by um, by United Launch Alliance between Lockheed Martin and Boeing. But nevertheless, we've got some private enterprise or not, we're there. We have the ability to put mankind into space and to me, that is important. All right. There's a universal law that states, whatever you believe yourself to be, you become. This belief will forever hold the nation's attitude or your personal attitude and also attention into this belief, whether it is truthful or not. I'll read it again. There is a universal law that states, whatever you believe yourself to be, you become. This belief will forever hold the nation's attitude and also attention into this belief, whether it is truthful or not. So this is where we come back to our own power, our own beliefs, and not to be told again and again that you're racist, even though some are out there, that you're poor because that can be changed. So remember what you choose to identify with, you will identify with until you choose to change your mind. All right, back to Caitlin for another another tip. Life pro tip. If you find yourself cheering for the same people's uprising in a foreign nation that the United States State Department is also, also loudly cheering for, it's because you've been propagandized. Please revise your media consumption habits and critical thinking skills accordingly. All right, so we're identifying with what we've been told. So we're identifying with something that has been shared with us rather than something we have deduced and come to a conclusion on our own. You are free to think, well, let's just say, let's just read it and then we'll talk about it. You are free as long as we control your resources, as long as we control your education, as long as we control your currency. One day we'll have a talk about Bitcoin and digital assets and how, and how important they're going to be probably in the relatively near future. You're, you're free as long as we control your internet. You're as free as long as we control your military. You're as free as long as we control your justice and free as long as we control your land. Now, I'd look at land as probably taxation. That little bunker called taxation, where if you kind of miss that because of whatever reason, then your land is no longer yours. Yes, Vicky, we do become what we think about. And, and Robin, an epic explosion. We could, yeah, it could have been a deal breaker. In fact, if I was an astronaut going on to uh, probably the following flight, I'd have been just a little nervous about getting on that craft. I think anytime you get on that kind of kind of a, a fuel thing, mm, it, you, you, you've got to have a pause. You've got to be, be a very, very brave person to, to go through that route. All right, there's a Buddhist saying, first there's a mountain. Then there isn't. And then there is. Think about it. So you see the problem. You see something that seems to be insurmountable. You're, you're on a hike and you've got this, this 8,000 foot peak right there. And you've got a bag of water. You've got some, some snacks, but still bloody ahead of you, there's this mountain. And then you see the path. You see that, yeah, there's the walkway over there, and there it is. There's the zigzags, and then, then the way. Then there's over the crest of the hill to to the summit. So that's the then there isn't because you see the means of accomplishment. You see how you're going to get to the goal, and then there is, and that's taking the first step. So we recognize the mountain we have to cross. You see the way across, and then you begin the journey. And that's where we are. We see all the problems that are out there. And the way through it 
has to be with love. There's no other tool that can bring us together. There's nothing as powerful as that. And we've got to slow down and restrain the consumption of that propaganda. There's no other way to get your, your thoughts back, to get your own mind back, to get your own emotions back. There's no other way to do it but to turn the thing off and be then be begin to be whole again with yourself. So one of our presidents has left us with a job. And John F. Kennedy probably, I just I didn't get to live through that presidency. I came aboard on, on this planet just after. And I really wonder how many of us wouldn't have had to come here had this man, had this family been able to do what it was likely sent here to do. He said, one day after I'm long gone, you will remember me and say we should have stopped the nuclear program of Israel, abolished the Federal Reserve, and kicked all secret societies, occultists, and usurpers, and Zionists out of our wonderful country. To keep it that way, it is never too late. Just remember that. He said so many things that were very, very powerful. All right, so uh, something else I came up on a walk the other day was that we imagine with our desires. What do you desire? What are you looking for? What do you want to see on the news? What do you want to see in your spouse's eyes? What do you want to see your friends bring to you? And we imagine these things before they happen. And as we imagine and power it with emotion, we begin to create that creation. We create that reality. Either we see disaster, we see anger, we see hatred, and we imagine that so we expect it. Then that becomes the path of least resistance. It's very easy to walk down that journey when you've already created it with your imagination. So then the last one, the last one, when our goals have come into union, into one, we will have won. It's that simple. So we've got two sides. There's so many points of view, but we've decided to choose a mode of slavery, slavery to red, a slavery to blue. We've chosen to willingly walk into a box, into a mental trap. And once we have said, I agree with this, we have to defend it until that powerful day comes along that says, I can choose to make a different choice. I can change how I think about this. And that becomes seeing the way over that mountain. That becomes the means of accomplishment, is changing willfully and gladly how we view and look for the world. And only with that will we then have won. And this journey will slowly or at least excitedly come to an end because we can't sustain the way it's been for another 10 months, another 10 years. It won't happen. We will fall apart and descend into chaos that nobody wants to experience. So I can see, I know that at some point we will choose to look at things in a different way. And with that, finally, I think we'll do it. I think we'll do another one of these coming up on Monday, same place, same time. And um, hopefully just as uh, almost just as fun. Well, or a little more fun. I was a little nervous about going into this, like, what are we going to talk about? But there's just so much. There's so much. All right, guys. Love you. Take care and keep looking up.